There's a lot of little things to cover today. And that's what makes the crinoline a little bit challenging because there are just so many little things that are happening between technology, between science, between people, silhouettes, all these things are kind of all happening at exactly the same time. And it becomes a little overwhelming. There's really only a small amount of things that you need to kind of commit to for this period, specifically when we talk about silhouette. And there, there are some small details, but a lot of this stuff should start to feel more and more um, comfortable, I guess you could say, within your world, because we're going to see things that feel pretty much the way that clothes live on us today. Now, before we get too much further, there are a couple of things that I want to sort of talk about, which was something that was in last lecture, but we didn't get a chance to sort of go through. And that was the idea of gores and godets. So the idea of both gores and godets are different ways of cutting pieces of cloth to give shape to the body. And I've kept our half stay here, our little half stay that we had before. And you notice that it's basically a rectangle of fabric but there are these little inserts, these little triangles. And do you notice how that gives a flare to it? A little bit of a, a flip in there? That is a godet. Now, what can we do with that? All sorts of things. We could put them on sleeves. We can put them on hems. Any place that we want to insert a little bit of fullness. But when we're shaping more towards the body, we want to use things like gores. So today we're going to be going from the word stay, stay, to now the word that we all kind of know for these things, which is? That's what you get at home, sorry. <laughs> right, we're going to use the word corset. Now, do you notice how this is not a rectangle? Right? They're individual. I'll put it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little confusing. That's why we put the lace at the top. Then we know what the top is. But if you notice, you can see that it's made up of individual shaped panels, right? And can you see how that gives it shape? Each one of these is cut in a very different way to allow it when it goes on the body. We're going to come back to corset in a second, but, but can you see how now, even though we can sort of see a rectangle in there, it's now flaring, it's shaping. And that is a gore, where we have individual pieces that are reshaped to fit the body. Where we see that the most are things like gourd skirts. You may have a gourd skirt where it is made up of panels, individual pieces that are sewn together that fit through the waist, through the hip, and then it flares out. You can see that they're all kind of cut the same, but it's each of those shapes that gives it fullness or fit at certain times. And so when we're talking about now, these sort of things, corsets, we're gonna be using a very different technology to understand how to mold the body then just kind of support as we have been doing before, right? Bosom support. Now you can see this is total body support and total body shaping, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, as we're going through, we also have to acknowledge a bunch of other different things that happened. And this was all in the lecture, but it is worth just sort of pointing out again. The invention of the sewing machine is incredibly important in this period not only because it changes how we manufacture clothes, but it also makes the process of sewing clothes so much easier, even for a home sewer, that then people can produce garments in a very different way. We're gonna be talking about the silhouette, and I'm just gonna sort of move to this very last one very quickly, but look at the, how big that skirt is, right? Imagine hand sewing that. Now, some people still had to. Not everybody could have a sewing machine. But you could see how the sewing machine would make something like this much easier to sew. And 
as it goes along, you can see how the use of the sewing machine would be almost in, in, in completely important in developing these sort of things. Now, the sewing machine story is very difficult. It's very long, but it was started in 1840 is usually where we put it with this guy named Timonier. And if you watch the video, you saw a little bit about him. But the thing about Timonier that's really fun and scary is he created this thing because it had been sort of being developed for a long time, but he finally got it to work and he's like, aren't I awesome? Well, of course, all the tailors and all the dressmakers who make a living from hand sewing are like, no, <laughs> this is not awesome. As a matter of fact, there's nothing awesome about this. And they ran him out of town. They broke all the machines. They broke his windows. But we see the information and the ideas sort of spread across the ocean because America is one of those places that's kind of wants to do everything um, that technology can allow. And so we see the, the sewing machine really develop in the United States to the degree that that is what we sort of acknowledge the sewing machine to be. But there is a very long history. And we can see how how ba -da -da, actually <laughs> invented the sewing machine as we know it today. However, Singer, there were some patent issues and could kind of steal that. But ultimately, who do we remember? Singer because they're the ones who mass marketed it. So you can imagine how technology like that would help. The idea of chemistry being developed in this era is kind of important. Now, chemistry in a lot of ways up till this point was alchemy, right? What's alchemy? Um, a lot of like further science, further science lead to gold. Right, it starts from this idea that, oh, lead can become gold, right? But the scientific process of it is still being figured out as we understand chemistry today. And one of the first sort of inventions chemistry wise is this idea of dyes, of synthetic dyes that change textiles into the things that we all love. Almost everything that you're probably wearing was dyed with a synthetic dye, meaning a chemical composition as opposed to a natural dye which for hundreds of thousands of years had basically been the only thing. And this young person, Mr. Perkin, who you probably read about, wanted to know everything about, he was no older than any of you. And it was kind of all a mistake. But through this process of experimentation, he came up with this color that they called mauve, mauvine, or we call it today purple, that changed the whole face of color. Because these colors, not only were they easier to produce, they were more vibrant and they were more fast. So does anybody know what fast means when we're talking about dye? Huh? It, wash out. it tends not to wash out. And so it's vibrancy, you know, even with natural dyes, you can kind of get some vibrant colors. And certainly we've seen plenty of them. But once you start rinsing it, rinsing it, what happens is the color basically rinses out of it. But these chemical colors, along with a mordant, bond to the textile in a way that you've never, ever seen before. We also have to talk about Charles Worth, right? Now, Charles Worth is an incredibly important figure when we talk about costume history, because he, along with Empress Eugenie, he was an Englishman, he went to France, set up a shop, but Empress Eugenie decided, I need you know, somebody to kind of create styles for me and matched right up with Charles Worth. And he became kind of the arbiter of fashion for the entire rest of this century. Now, it's not to say that there weren't other people, we're even gonna talk about somebody else who's really important in this period. However, he set the stage for fashion in a way that hadn't been done before. And we think about this section from crinoline to bustle, even into our next period, as being very dynamic as far as silhouette is concerned. And he had a lot to do with that. But remember how when we were looking at things, it was like, oh, here's a big dress. Then here's a narrow dress. Then here's another big dress. Then here's something that's different. 
he sort of surveys it and slowly modifies and slowly changes the period silhouette so that we see more of a transition, 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 transition through things as opposed to these really weird dynamic styles. But everybody sort of bows to him because he is, he is the most important sort of fashion designer. Now, not everybody could have worth clothes, but everybody could steal the ideas of worth, right? And because so many people put him in the sort of category of the, the designer of the day, they followed his lead. And the ladies' magazines that sent out information followed that and brought it up to be kind of the first designer, if that makes sense. All these silhouettes, all these structures that we're going to see, most of those are sort of attributed to him in the silhouette and the idea of the silhouette. And that leads us to that idea of hope couture, which we had talked about before, this idea of high sewing that is, for most of us, completely out of our hands, out of our ability to ever own anything hope couture. Um, I think that's it for the big stuff, for the really big stuff. But there are other things that are coming up. The, the thing I want you to remember, as I said, is the silhouette and how the silhouette sort of transitions from the empire, and I kind of left that here, to 20 years later through the bounce of the romantic into this sort of silhouette. So for those of you at home, give me a second. Do, 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 do. So that you can see what everybody else is seeing. So here we see, first of all, the male silhouette. And if you notice, almost nothing changes. As I said last time, we are going to be stuck in the idea of a shirt, a tie, a waistcoat, a jacket, a trouser, and a shoe, and some form of hose, basically up into the 20th century. What does change, though, is the silhouette. Through the course of the, of the romantic into the crinoline, what we tend to see is a boxiness starting. Remember in the romantic, we saw very curved sort of lyrical silhouettes that fit the body in that frock coat. It felt like a dress. We're still going to have frock coats, but they tend to be much boxier. The other thing that we see, and this is a term that we're going to talk about when we get inside, is this idea of eclecticism. So what does eclecticism mean? A bunch of different things in different places. Yeah, all pulled together and being like fabulous. I also call it maximalist. If you're a fashion person, or sorry, a, a home decorating person, maximalist was a big idea for a while, where it's just everything. Whatever strikes your fancy, bring it on. And the reason for that in some ways is, you know, at least interior wise, was because people were doing tours of the world, right? They were going out, leaving, going to explore distant lands, and they bring things back with them. And so in their interiors, they would often have really kooky stuff all just jammed in there, almost like a museum, with no happenstance. You could have an ancient you know, Ming vase next to um, a Turkish rug. Who cares? And with this idea of color as well, color becomes very exciting. So people are going to jam as much color as they can in. So you may have a red settee with yellow curtains and orange uh, rugs because it's exciting and it's, it's showing off everything that you can possibly have. Men's clothes do tend to be eclectic in some ways, where we break from this idea of suits, where we tend to see everything being different textiles. Now, it still plays like a suit. We still have a jacket, a waistcoat, and trousers, but we'll often see things like plaid trousers with a uh, blue waistcoat within a gray outer coat or a brown outer coat. Because they're playing on that. And they're playing on the idea that textiles are starting to 
really become important, not only visually, like the plaids that we'll talk about, or um, uh, some of the other weaving techniques, but you have to imagine that they need to crank out for these sort of silhouettes that we're going to get to wide, thick, decorative fabrics in every way possible, right? You're not building a dress out of a few little yards and whipping it together. You know, you need 10 yards of textile. So textile mills, as we know, because most of us are Rhode Islanders, or at least New Englanders, we know that the textile trade was incredibly important up here. And those are working overtime to make sure that those, that those textiles can happen. And we, we see that also in, in um, France and in England as well. Very important to, you know, developing clothing, but also influencing what types of textiles go on people. Overall, though, the silhouette gets closer and closer and closer, and the details get closer and closer and closer to what we understand. The biggest thing is boxiness that we're going to see. But other than that, it's pretty much just clothes. Where we see the most dramatic are through women's clothes. And as I said, we see that turn kind of happen at the beginning of the 19th century, where now women's clothes are really going to inform us what the true period is. And if we think about the romantic, let's see, we have a better, no, nope, we don't. If we think about the romantic, we thought about that sort of rounded, I brought her out, she has a whole outfit that you didn't get to see because you know, you weren't here. But you can see sort of a roundness that is developed here through the bust, through the waist, and the skirt being sort of a big poof, shorter, disproportionate, though, little weird. What we start to do is we go back to some of the ideas we had previously, whether it was the, uh, the Baroque with the, the Restoration, the Elizabethan, and really focus now on the idea of the shape of the bodice. Can you see how that shape is a little bit different, right? It's really hugging the curves of the body. And again, what is really important for this? This, the corset. Now, we have to be very careful of corset mythology because until you wear a corset, do you know what a corset really does? And a good corset doesn't actually ruin your body. It should support and fit you exceptionally well. When we think about these stays, not these certainly, but the 18th century stays, those really pushed our body into place because there were say steels or even ribs of wood. In this case, we're focusing on baleen or whalebone. So does anybody know where whalebone comes from? Yeah. Okay. Filter feeding whales. Correct. They have a filter system that goes across that filters plankton, and it's a cartilage that runs across the face. And in this case, what they do is they slice it into thin little strips, and that is what is used in these corsets. Now, what makes that great is that whalebone because it is natural because it 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 is cartilage. It actually warms and shapes to the body as opposed to compresses the body. If you imagine what steel might do, right, that would really start to hurt. But this ultimately supports the body by molding into place. And you can imagine with all these undulations, all these curves, that whalebone would be very useful in its curving and its ability to shape on the body. Uh, but these corsets would be incredibly important in helping to manufacture that silhouette. And when we look at the silhouettes, especially through this period, we're going to see that those bodices, those upper parts, are going to shape and shape and shape and shape in a way that we haven't seen before. And so we tend to get a, you know, a roundness through the bosom and then a shape into the waist. Now, people could tight lace. People still do tight lace. But the idea was you worked within the contents of your body. You weren't going from like a 33 
inch waist down to 19 or 12 inches, right? That's just physically impossible. But you could get a reduction. Every once in a while, you might have something that is made to be reduced, say for a very special occasion, an evening event or something. But day to day, people aren't really going to that extreme. And certainly movies like Gone with the Wind sort of propel that idea, that opening scene in Bridgerton that we talked about where, oh, we've got to make you thinner, thinner. And especially when we're thinking about this, who cares about the waist, right? Which is that very different. So, but our bodies being soft allow us to move parts of the bodies into different places to create that silhouette. But what is really what we take away from this is the idea of the skirt. Notice how round and full this skirt is. And we actually see the skirt in two sort of phases. Through the 1850s, the idea of the skirt, sorry, the idea of the skirt is that it encompasses the entirety of us. So our body, that center section is if, imagine that I took a, an 1850s lady and just right at the waist, right? You would see the body would be right in the center and the, the skirt would surround them pretty much equally. Slowly through the course of the 50s and into the 60s, what we see is the body center start to move more towards the front. So even though it feels circular in a lot of cases, the body is more towards the front. So we have a little bit more placement. So let's take a look at our dress that is here. So we can see throughout the course of this that this just doesn't happen magically, right? We've got a lot of stuff happening underneath that is probably going to get us to this world. But looking at it, can you guess where we are in 1850s or 1860s? Why 1860s? Right. The body has sort of moved forward. And though this still extends out the front, right? You can see there is some extension out the front. Most of it is being drawn towards the back. But you notice how it still feels circular? Okay, that the idea of it is that it emphasizes this circle, but it's still ultimately moving where the position of the body is. Now, how do we keep it this full? Magic? Okay, so the idea of crinoline is what is, hence the name of the term. They don't have crinoline era paintings. We don't have crinoline era books. We're still in some cases either in romantic or the, the nouveau gothic era. But what is crinoline? Well, it is an underskirt, but what is crinoline itself as a word? Anybody? So it's a textile and the crin means horsehair. So horsehair is a very tightly but thickly woven textile. And you can imagine the coarseness of that, that hair would create textile that would sort of spring out, right? And so this idea of making petticoats out of crinoline, making it out of something dense like that, would help create this fullness. But what would be the problem of having lots and lots of petticoats that are made out of horse hair and are really... Yeah, exactly. What is hair's intention? It's to insulate, right? So what eventually starts to develop is well, maybe we can come up with an idea like we've seen before that allows us some freedom. And the idea is the cage crinoline. So underneath this skirt, we have a petticoat. Underneath, we have a garment very similar to the farthingale that we saw before where there are rows and rows right, of metal rings joined 
with some sort of textile in between them to create volume all the way around. Now, this sort of one in its, you know, once I lift the skirts away, you can see it starts to center up a little bit, right? Can you see how it's a little bit more farther? Well, there's actually a panel in back that pushes the body forward. When I move my skirt, you can see how the weight shifts. And that's what makes this very difficult, and very challenging, because it's all about physics. But once we start to put these skirts back, we'll start to see it fall back into place. That term, page crinoline, is what we're going to use for that physical heavy structure. We'll see many variations of the cage crinoline. We want to be careful of the word hoop because hoop is a very open word that has been used all the way since um, the farthingale days to describe anything. So I like cage crinoline because it speaks very specifically to this. Now, also on our figure here, we have a couple other things. You can see the bodice here is very similar to a waistcoat, right? So we see some masculine influence, in this case, a walking suit. But you can see how the body is molded into place. And then on top of this, we have a jacket. And if we notice again, for those of you who were playing first semester, we see these sort of Tudor-like sleeves, these very kind of uh, conical sleeves. We call these sleeves pagoda sleeves. So what is a pagoda? I might be the wrong pagoda, but it's like a type of temple. OK, it's a temple that we see traditionally in Asia in which it's a series of buildings that are built on top of each other. So it's sort of, it's not triangular. It's not like a pyramid per se, but they get smaller as they go up. And one of the reasons we call this the pagoda, not only because of its triangularity, but often we'll see them cut into multiple tiers. So it looks like a building on a building on a building. Underneath, this was in the lecture, we see this full sleeve. Notice that there's a full sleeve in there. That's a bishop sleeve. And you notice that fills up the area of the sleeve. And you see a little Rococo in here too, right? Sometimes these sleeves, they even call them engageant because there would be a little fake sleeve that would be attached at the wrist. We remember that word. But <clears throat> in this case, we see the bishop sleeve. The last thing I want you, oh, the jacket itself. We didn't even talk about the jacket itself. Notice that this short style becomes very popular. We've seen a short style jacket before. For men, though, what kind of jacket was that? The bolero, exactly. Guess what we call this? The bolero. <laughs> but this short little jacket is sort of um, a similar jacket that say matadors wear and such. And that's where that term bolero sort of comes from, that short jacket. But you can see how what this would do is help mold to the body and really put emphasis on the waist. Notice also the collars are not high. They tend to sit at the neck. We have this idea of everything in the Victorian era being these big, high collars. Not yet. We'll see those, I promise you. Not yet. They just tend to be little bands. And so as we're thinking about the movement, things like that Bertha, which come across that sort of piece of cloth or, or decoration that opens up the neck, that off the shoulderness, which we will see, will sort of typify what we're looking at. But really, it's about this idea of the volume of the skirt slowly moving towards the back. We're going to see lots and lots of different variations of this because we have tons and tons of materials, primary sources from this period. This is really where we're getting to the point where we're going to keep, we're going to see a lot of stuff, like stuff that exists. And that's always super fun. Okay. Um, and for those of you at home, there is that corset that I was talking about. So we're ready to dive into some slides. Awesome.
Do you mind hitting the lights for us, Bridget? Thank you. Okay. So for those of you at home, I, as you always know, I can't see chat all that well. So if you have a question, please speak up. <laughs> I might be able to see your name come up. Um, and I should have done this before. There we go. Okay, so I kind of like this uh, because uh, this is from you know 2019. Victor and Rolf, who are incredible, crazy, wonderful, whimsical designers. If you ever get to see any of their stuff, it's just super fun. But we see this idea of volume coming back time and time and time again, and even in this case. You know, it's very interesting because this sort of speaks to social distancing as well. I like to think of the crinoline as the original social distancing because, you know, women were considered to be um, very, uh, what's a good word, uh, capable of temptation. And so the physical realm around them, this physical bubble, in a way, sort of said, stay back. And this is where we get that whole idea of kind of the Victorian mentality about people and such. So as we were talking about temples, pagodas, here we can see a series of buildings on top of each building. And this is, we see this all throughout Asia. This one, I believe, is a Chinese pagoda. And you can see how it's a smaller building, smaller building, smaller building. I think this one is Thai. I think this is a talk. So it's a different shape, but it's the same idea, a stacked building. And you can see how very similar to the idea of the sleeves. Even if we look at the, uh, the fountain in the front, we see a very similar idea. Here we see a Japanese temple that has that same sort of pagoda proportions, right? Slowly building on top of building. And again, remember, one of the things that's really interesting to people is the East. You know, Japan had been closed down for an incredibly long time. And now they were starting to make arrangements, Europe was, with Japan to start trading again. So anything Japanese was like, bring it on. There's a whole musical based on this. In America, even in some European countries, we see the empire style or the neo-Gothic style becoming popular. Does this look familiar to anybody? It looks like the House of Knives Out. It does look a little bit like the House of Knives Out. It is in Newport. This is Chateau sur Mer, which is, is one of the older buildings on Bellevue Avenue that wasn't destroyed. Uh, and when you go inside, you can get a sense of that kind of mid-century Victoriana. You know, the insides are very eclectic. Um, there's another building that's sort of across the street that's called the Bell House. That has a very similar idea, but that's moving in a little bit. But it's kind of that Gothic style that we expect from like haunted houses and such, right? It has a very unique style. Um, here we can see also the Italiente style that became popular. This is a house from my hometown, which looks very similar to Beechwood, where I used to live. But it was this kind of uh, uh, Renaissance revival idea, because everything's about revivals, with these sort of rounded windows, the boxiness. We even see this sort of widow's walk up here at the top. Interior-wise, anything can kind of go in a lot of ways. And can you see a lot of Rococo in this, right? The sort of volume and the excess. However, if you notice, you can see the decoration, the adornment tends to be boosted up a little bit. The colors are a little bit more vibrant. The decoration is just a little bit more, uh, uh, but especially in some of these older houses, we do see that reminiscent sort of Rococo styling. Here we can see sort of a, a a modest interior, 
But again, do you see how it's very eclectic? There's a lot going on, whether it is the two vases that are at the side of the chimney or the Rococo um, candelabras. But then we also have like this little strange table with a lot of detail. Everything gets its own story and that's okay. For some of us, it makes us crazy. For others, they can't imagine anything better. Here's one that's a little bit more refined, but here I'd like you to look at the furniture because notice that the chairs, we see one here with arms, right? And then we see one with almost no arms. Why would we see one with almost no arms? Yeah. Right. Imagine this sort of outfit sitting down the little, you can see they're almost like little nubbin arms, right? Those would sort of sit under, but you couldn't sit in a chair necessarily with arms this deep. And so it would require you to sort of, we start to see gendered chairs, right? If you go to a, a formal dining area, especially from this period, often you'll see that the head of the table has arms, and then the other chairs do not, because you don't know if it's going to be a man or a woman sitting in that chair. But also things like sofas become really popular, just as we saw in the Rococo. Why? Because of the volume. You can imagine that that would be very easy to perch on. I don't know why I'm holding this like it's going to change my slide for me. We already saw these. So these are going to be built in. All these things we saw and everybody at home already saw. Great. So here we see that timeline going from the 1830s. So we can see it's kind of the basic idea for from the 1830s all the way through the 1860s, which is a fitted bodice and a fullish skirt. But what you notice is it's kind of volume sleeves and kind of drippy and it starts to deflate down a little bit as we get through the 40s and then all of a sudden it starts to volume up again right and part of that too if we look right here where it says um 1848 and even a little bit where it says 1846 we're starting to add tears to the skirt as well and that was one of the things with Empress Eugenie and and Charles Worth to take these skirts and put many, many rows of ruffles on them, which helps give it volume, but also creates a horizontal line, which makes it look even bigger. And you can see by 1857, the end of this slide, how volume, how much volume is there. And then you can see that that cream puff, right, move from being completely encircling the body to slowly moving towards the back. Can you see that? So that by the time we start to hit the 70s, all of our emphasis is going to be on the back. But we'll get there next time, I promise you. So think, you know, just keep that in mind overall. So this is the basis of what we're talking about. Now, for those of you who took the final, one of the only challenges I found was a lot of people forgot that we do not wear any sort of foundation garment like a stay or a corset directly on the body. We always have something underneath it for a couple reasons. First of all, if you think about those stay in things, those would be made out of very heavy materials. Imagine how that would feel on your softer parts. That would hurt, right? So a shift or a chemise underneath would always be important. But especially when we're dealing with corsetry like this, you would need something to sort of, as you were moving your body, right? Tightening these stays, these corsets. See, I keep defaulting to the word stay. I'm so like, don't use the word corset. When you would tighten the corset, your body would need to shift a little bit. And you can imagine that that would cause a lot of abrasion. So remember that we're always gonna have some sort of slip or some sort of chemise underneath it all. But here we can see the corset. And you can see that it is very shaped. It even has that dip in the front, the bask in the front with that latch system that we call the busk. And then here we can see the crinoline. Now, this is a, a lighter crinoline and the cage crinoline. But you can see that it's a series of rings, just like the farthingale that we talked about before, that are all held together with soft tape. 
piece of cloth that they go through. And then at the bottom here, we can see actual crinoline. This is heavy horsehair that is joined to the bottom to give it kind of perfect volume. And it gives it a little bit of weight. If you've ever worn anything like this, whether it was a cage crinoline or a hoop, you know they tend to move around a lot when you don't want them to. So you need something to weight them into place. You can see how we have this sort of red belt that is how it joins onto the body and then it comes down. Here we can see that corset and you can see how dynamic that shaping is for the period, right? Now, again, this is probably not too far from the actual waist shape of that person, but making it just a little tighter, the soft parts of the body either go up or they go down. So you can see how there is a very dynamic curvature that is created. You can see the gores, those individual pieces that are joined together with then all of those bones in place. And notice this idea of the latch in the front, this bust. What makes that great? You can lace it up and then you can take it off. You don't have to keep lacing and relacing every time you're wearing it. Here we can see another corset. And this one, um, we can see how much dynamic shape is in it. In fact, even look at the bust, how that's filled out. But you can see all of those bones, all of those shapes. And then over here to the side, you can see many different types of corsets as well. Now, the idea of straps starts to go away, especially because we want that neckline, um, that big open neckline. So we tend not to see as many straps on corsets anymore. And that's the other reason that we would need that shift underneath to create some sort of, you know, holding just by sheer luck and will, right? But you can imagine if this is all secured on your waist, it's not going anywhere, right? You like my little man? Okay. Now, we would look at this and we would call this what? Okay, we see kind of a blousiness in this. Some people might call it a camisole as well, though we tend to think of a camisole as just with straps. But what this actually is, is a corset cover. So what you would do is you would put on your shift, then you'd put on your corset, and then you would put a corset cover on. Now, the reason that they wouldn't put the corset over this is again, imagine when you're shifting the body, you would want textile running all the way down. Because um, if you're wearing something that's short and you move, what's going to happen is that textile is going to ride up and then you're going to have like that bunchiness, you know, that drives you nuts, right? We don't want that. We want it nice and smooth. So they would put these over partially because if I put a dress over this, you get like that little kind of rococo -y detail, but also it smooths out all the sections of the corset itself. So here we see. A, and I love this, it's called adjustable bustle and skirt, but a cage crinoline very similar to the one that I showed you, which is an enclosed one, right? All muslin with then the rings sewn into it. And you can imagine how flexible that would be. And just like this one, you can see that it would open in the front. That makes it much easier to get into than trying to, trying to hook it around yourself because also getting ourselves ready is um, even though we may have support, always better to have a little bit. Here we see cage crinolines that actually are made out of uh, down, I believe, meaning that they're, they're kind of like puffer jackets, right? And they're standing out. They probably have some boning in them, but you can see how sort of fluffy they are. And that down would probably be very um, lightweight. And you can see how you could adjust the fullness by those little ties in the front. But what we tend to see are more things like this, where again, it's the rings and then the ribbons holding them in place to allow for movement side to side, to allow to sit and such. And then we can see the big textile hem at the bottom of it. And here we see a real one. In a lot of cases, they are just wire. You know, they're very thin pieces of metal as opposed to big, thick 
metal that we might use today, but you get a sense of how that would be. And those red tapes that you see are cloth, you know, to allow for flexibility. And here we can see how it's going to change, right? What kind, what, what period would you say this one was? Right, the latter 60s, because it's all the emphasis is towards the back. But you can see how if the body was in there, there's still a little bit that's happening here in the front. Here we can see a shop. Now remember, photography is really starting to kick in. And so we're going to start seeing photographs of wonderful people doing wonderful things. But here we can see a crinoline shop where you can see the cage crinoline along with cloth crinoline, sorry, <laughs> living together in harmony. And we can see the women down underneath wearing something underneath those skirts. Whether they could, could afford those or not, that's different to say, but we see all of those. And here we can get sort of a cartoon of the amount of shape that might be in there. And you can see, you know, how the body would be reshaped through the corset. And then you see the cage crinoline down here, in this case done with sort of padded wires, you know, to give it even more volume. But notice in this case, and this tells us it's probably earlier, can you see the tiered skirt? Can you see how that makes it even more volume? not only from the horizontal line visually, but also each one sort of kicks out. Here we can see, um, this is a winter halter portrait, but our first instinct probably, right, is Rococo, because there's a lot of Rococo happening here. But if you notice, like the shoulders are kind of telling a different story, even look at the arms right here, it feels shorter. But she is certainly playing into the Rococo world. So we do see an interest in that. And even here in this illustration, there is kind of a lot of Rococo ness to it, but some of these things are gonna earmark it a little bit different. First of all, notice all the tiered skirts, right? You can see how that's gonna create a lot of volume. Secondly, notice that they're all kind of encompassed. Look at this one right here, even though she's sitting down, it's sort of like all the way around her. But then notice the necklines, those very deep decolletage necklines that again are sitting right on the bone of the, the shoulder. And one of the ways I, you know, sort of always look at it, you never want to see the crevice of the armpit, like that's your line. If it dips down there, you're in 80s territory, right? <laughs> 80s prom dress. Uh, but you could see kind of the ideas like there is kind of an engagement meaning like Rococo on the jaw detail happening there, but everybody is sort of evolving these clothes to sort of meet their personality. That's what I love about this, this painting, you know, everybody has a very different personality, but are all in fashion at the same time. And that's Eugenie and her ladies. Well, we're going fast. We didn't mean to do that. So here we can see some, what I would call day dresses in a paisley in a calico, and you can see how they're using the horizontal line to emphasize the skirting. And we can see sort of the fit of the body, but then the pagoda sleeve, that sort of very flared sleeve. In fact, look at this one. It looks like that an engagement from the Rococo, those more tiered styles, but we can notice their kind of bubble shape, their volume. Many of these, when they're shown in museums, they won't put them under the scale of crinoline that would normally be seen because that can cause a lot of damage to the textiles, you know, because it's pressure. So a lot of times they feel much smaller than the fashion illustrations. But here we can see a very simple day dress molded to the body. And in fact, some of these pleats do kind of remind me of the Rococo, you know, in the, the um, Don Frost says. But here you can see the tiered skirt. 1854. And you can see that, you know, this is a piece of cloth sewn onto a, a foundation. And then there's a next piece of cloth sewn onto the foundation. You can see the tiered sleeves going on here that feel pretty pagoda like. And then notice that low collar, that low lace collar, not that high collar that we might think. Here we can see another piece of uh, bodice fit in this case. We see 
which, which shows just a little bit probably where that corset is hitting, but you can see that it's round and then shaped in. Notice the sleeves. In this case, it has sort of a, an upper pagoda, but then it really comes down and flares down as well. We can also see kind of a Rococo detail down the front, but notice the volume of the skirt there. And then notice that simple little bit of white around the neck, the little bit of lace that is happening there. Here we can see an outdoor outfit, and we can see that sort of idea of the tiered skirt and see how it does give so much more volume to it. And even in a sense, the sleeve is giving a lower sort of cross line to the body as well to give it some broad quality. Now, one of my favorite dresses. You know, like, why this one? Well, we actually have a couple of them here, but here we can see a day dress, right? All the hallmarks that we would know, fitted bodice, pagoda sleeve. We see the bishop sleeve underneath. We see the collar go up to the neck. And then tirapalooza, right? Tier, 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 tier. And I love it because you have to imagine that these skirts use a lot of fabric, sometimes 11 yards of fabric. So you can't have a skirt for every occasion. What you do is you make a different bodice. <laughs> That's why I love this. So you have a day bodice and an evening bodice because the evening bodice needs almost no cloth whatsoever, but it allows you to wear this in multiple ways. And you can see, again, really a strong emphasis on the shoulder, a lot of decolletage. Notice no sleeves happening. There's just like a little bit of detail covering the ball of the sleeve. And notice how deep that basque is in the front, right? It's almost Elizabethan proportions. Here we see another dress, this time in plaid. So plaids are very popular because of Balmoral, because Queen Victoria spent a lot of time at Balmoral. And we know the difference between plaids and tartans. Yes? You don't? Okay, so what is a tartan? Okay, tartans are Scottish plaids that represent through their weaving, through that plaid, a certain family. It's the colors, it's the arrangement, it's the size of the squares, it's brigadoon, right? Plaid is any form of this. So this is a plaid, this isn't a tartan, because this probably doesn't represent any family from Scotland. And even if you see within the plaid, they're playing around with weaving details. Can you see the kind of scrolly, squirrely stuff happening? But notice the level of workmanship that's going on here with the plaid, matching it up, but then how the bodice shapes with the plaid. It emphasizes across the shoulder. We see the pagoda sleeves. And then we see that beautifully tailored bodice up on top. Nothing too fancy. But the, letting the plaid do a lot of the work there, right? Really beautiful. Um, I just love this. Love it. Here we see another bodice. And notice, again, one of the challenges is figuring out how the bodice and the skirt kind of live together. Because when you have that much volume, sometimes it's difficult to figure out how this is going to sort of work. So we tend to have separate bodices and skirts, right? So it looks like a full gown, but often there's separate pieces. And you can see that there's probably a very strong waistband going on right here. We can see the buttons all the way down the front, which makes it easier to get dressed yourself. We see the full sleeve, the full pagoda sleeve, and then we see the bishop sleeve happening there as well. So here we're looking at a bolero. Now, is it as dramatic as this bolero? No, but you can see that it is cut away from the body to some degree and is short. And we'll see many variations of that bolero, but more often than not, they do have things like the pagoda sleeves or the bishop sleeves with this blouse underneath. And this is probably not even a blouse. It's probably a tucker. It's like a fake blouse. 
But the use of separates is incredibly important, especially as people become more active. So here we're seeing a blouse and skirt combination, right? And we can tell that she's probably pretty important. I mean, that's a pretty fancy skirt. Silk taffeta, a beautiful plaid that is on it, and then a very, very sort of interesting blouse. I, I don't know, again, it's the eclecticism that sometimes makes me go, I'm sure it's fabulous, but it, it kind of resonates with each other. And then we can see that very, very, very full bishop sleeve happening there. The only thing I wish I knew, it looks like there's a tassel right here. I want to know what's happening. But really beautiful. So this idea of separates becomes incredibly important. And here we can see a bolero, right? That is very much like I was sort of talking about before. We see kind of a blouse underneath it. And then we see that belt. And these jackets, if you notice, a lot of times they have kind of military braiding on them. They were also called Zouave jackets after the, the Zouave army, which had very, very fanciful uniforms. Um, so we see some details happening there. And even just looking at this, is this 50s or 60s? Right, because we see that volume more towards the back, which actually is easier and more graceful. We're going to see a few kind of crazy little boleros because I love them. This one has my favorite, which is called the Swiss belt. You see this triangle belt that's there. It's kind of like a little boussier belt. Yeah, of course. Everybody needs a good Swiss belt. But look at this. I mean, it's very military looking, right? This jacket. And here we can see another bolero. Look at all that detail. I mean, just really, really, really beautiful. And here we can see sort of a simple basic dress, but notice that the bodice is fitting a little bit differently. Notice the volume in the skirts and notice how she's not sitting in the chair like we might sit in our chairs right now. You have to sit kind of upright, partially because the corset, but also with the volume of the skirt, you're sort of nestled on the edge of the chair. But she doesn't look terribly uncomfortable. In fact, she's one of the few smiling pictures you'll ever see. A lot of people were kind of spooked out by photography and they thought if you smiled, um, that would take your soul away. So another plaid, because I love plaid. I love plaid. How can you not love plaid? It's whimsical and it's fun. Look at this textile. I love it. So I would normally call this a calico, but it's not. It's really like a big um, Indian print. You know, if you have like an Indian tapestry or something, you can imagine this scale. But you can see the repetitive quality of it. You can see how it fits through the bodice and then really is creating a huge skirt. We can see that little bit of white around the neck. We even see a necklace, which is fabulous. And then these great bishop sleeves. Here we're seeing more like a man's suit almost. Doesn't this have suit vibes in a lot of ways? It feels very formal, um, but also maybe for an afternoon out. So you could see something made out of a lightweight linen or silk could be really useful. Now, does anybody know who this person is? All the way on the right. Anybody know who the person in the center is? I'm guessing that's the queen. It's not the queen, but close. America's queen in 19 or in 1861. Mary Todd Lincoln. So this is the first lady here. And the first lady's dress designer was this person here, Elizabeth Keckley. And Elizabeth Keckley was an enslaved woman who basically through hard work freed herself and moved to the North and started a dressmaking business. And her best client and her favorite client was Mary Todd Lincoln. And you have to imagine that you're dressing the first lady, right? Status goes through the roof. And she throughout Washington was considered to be the best dressmaker ever. Unfortunately, we only have a few dresses um, of hers that are available. I think I may have one coming up, but this one is uh, the inauguration ball dress, I believe. You can see it's the same exact dress, and you can see how they're not showing it to the volume that it probably was worn, right? You can see how full that is, how it's almost stretched across, but it's a little bit weak. 
here. What's kind of interesting is you can see that little bit of a scene in there, but ultimately it feels like the pleats are moving directly out of the bodice. But she became, um, you know, a very famous dressmaker, even after Lincoln had died, continued to make things for um, Mary Todd Lincoln. I consider her to be one of the first American designers in a lot of ways, one of the first people you ever hear about. Uh, Elizabeth Keckley. I think I mentioned her in the lecture. Um, and she went on to write a number of books. Um, some of them have been challenged a little bit, but still a very, very, very important person, especially when you think of how she worked directly with making the fashion for America and working with that person. And also notice that, you know, Mary Todd Lincoln was not a tiny lady. And certainly Queen Victoria was not a tiny lady either. So we know that people didn't have to, you know, only be, you know, like a 34, 12, 15, you know, we see stout bodies, we see full bodies as well. So here we see what was called the bloomer costume. If you remember in the lecture, the bloomer costume was considered to be scandalous. Women were arrested for wearing this. And what was it? It was basically a dress that just happened to be a little shorter with then a pair of Turkish trousers underneath. Scandalous, terrible. Eventually, it earned the name from Amelia Bloomer from upstate New York. She was one who sort of wore it, but they were called Turkish trousers. But really, you add one more row and it's a dress, right? Nothing more to it. Um, so we see the Turkish trousers there. Where this stays, and I'm going to skip over my favorite lady, Dr. Mary Walker, the very first um, uh, female surgeon from my hometown. But where that stays is in this. This is a bathing costume. And this is what people wore to bathe in, or I should say women would wear to bathe in. Not the men, they could go naked if they wanted to. But this would be a woolen dress with then a trouser underneath it, these Turkish trousers, also in wool, so that you could move around. They're not swimming the channel, as we might, in a bathing suit, but this is the bikini of the times, you know. And here we see some purple, and I just want you to see these dresses, which are, you know, those Perkin purples. And these are well over 150 years old, and look at these colors. Still as vibrant as the day that they were probably created. And here we can see evening gowns. Again, my last Ang, I just got to throw them in there, right? Because I love them so much. Ang. Uh, but we can see some kind of rococo ness to it, but ultimately it's things like the, um, oh, we see a little bit of armpit there, makes me crazy. But uh, we see, you know, that, that very deep decolletage that tells us that we're in the 50s. And here we see an evening gown. Look at how fancy that is, right? That's a lot. But also notice this tassel trim, which was very popular. Here we see um, two young ladies, and you can see basically the same exact dress with the tassel trim on it. And that would be the, the trim uh, made from the fibers that would weave those, those florals that were in there. Sometimes taste isn't great. I mean, it's kind of OK. I don't know. There's something about it that's a little strange. But we're playing. We're experimenting. And here we're just going to look through a variety of different dresses. You can see again volume, you can see design, you can see character in a sense in them. Everything is giving its own sort of um, idea to it all. And here we can see, you know, these fashion plates that would be so important because, you know, they wouldn't, they would send these out into the world to say, this is what this year's fashion is. And from these, you could look and create you know, your own clothes. Here we see a great pagoda sleeve with a huge, and look at those bishop sleeves, huge. Now notice this one. Doesn't this look like the gown of or the, 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 the robe of Lorraine, the queen's robe from the you know, revolution, but sort of redone, rethought with the silhouette of the 1860s and a few more. Again, it's just there's a lot going on. Um, we tend not to see coats as much as we do cloaks, because again, you have to imagine those silhouettes 
are very difficult. So cloaks and robes and, and pelerines are much more popular. And here we can see the style of boot that would be popular for pretty much the day. And you can see this beautiful silk satin boot with a lace up the side. They're still made in straights in a lot of cases, but your foot would accommodate. You could see that one side laces, you know, both of them would lace on the inside of them. But really beautiful detail in that. And then eventually we'll get into uh, much more interesting shoes. We don't tend to see a lot of shoes, right? Because those gowns are covering up the feet. And then just to review the idea of men's clothes, you know, this is that very romantic silhouette, right? We can see how shapely that is throughout the body. And then as it goes along, we tend to get into these very boxy silhouettes. And even those, the trousers are starting to get boxy as well, not as, as fit. But we're seeing a much more casual life find its way into clothing as well. In this case, that we call the sack suit. Just a, what we might call a sports jacket today, but very boxy as well. And we can tell that these people are in casual because they're wearing casual hats. We see the bowler, which is the rounded hat, and then we see the straw hat, the boater. Even with the gentlemen wearing frock coats, do you notice how they're just a lot more boxy? Less details, less puffy. We'll see them reshape, but we never really get back to that point. Look at these plaid trousers. They're fabulous, right? It's like right out of 1993. Um, but if you notice, they still sometimes have stirrups on them to keep them nice and taut. And then you can see the top hats informing us that they're probably much more formal. But you can see a lot of eclecticism. And also notice that the ties now feel like ties. They really just feel like bow ties. Here we can see it's a little dark under there, but everything is going to be modeled on sort of a tie idea around the neck, either in black or in a color. And we're eventually going to start to see ties like this, but we'll see them next time. Oh, I also, the reason we also, tailoring gets so good. Look at that lapel. Looks just like a lapel we'd have today, right? Nothing crazy there, no M's, no weirdness. It just fits the body perfectly. And notice that the collar is going to get slightly lower under the jaw. Look at him. I love that. They're so cute, aren't they? But we can see the eclectic, this plaid waistcoat, striped trouser, black jacket, collar, tie, along with his sister. They're so happy. Look at this deadbeat. Um, but we see the bow tie, right? Doesn't he look like he's up to no good? Come on. We see this really crazy facial hair, right? A little bit of the sideburns, the mugwumps. We see the um, double-breasted waistcoat, three pieces that don't quite match. This guy, again, the trousers and the waistcoat seem to match, but I always point this out because this probably isn't his waistcoat or it's secondhand because you notice it's a double-breasted waistcoat, but you notice how he's wearing it on the first button, right? So that probably means it doesn't fit him but he wanted to look good for his portrait. And here we can see that sack suit, right? We see a waistcoat, we see a trouser, we see a jacket, but it is much more boxy, just like, oh, oh, and I forgot to say, but the trousers are cut to the true waist still. So here you can see what we would call suspenders, but in this period, we call them braces. And here we can see a sort of formal frock coat with those sort of lapels and such, but notice that the pieces feel like they're all kind of eclectic. Where's my sack suit? There's my sack suit, a beautiful linen, but notice how boxy it is. And what would this sack suit be used for? Anything that wasn't work basically. You know, this is for tennis, this is for golf, this is for hiking, this is for everything. And you imagine everything else that they were wearing in heavy wools and, you know, frock coats and such. This must have felt like, you know, shorts and a, a t-shirt compared to what had been worn before. And as people get more active, we will eventually start to accommodate and create activity clothing. We're going to see some of that next time. Here we are. How thankful are we for this? What are we looking at? 
Venom, exactly, a pair of what we would call today genes. These are the oldest genes in existence, I believe. And, you know, they're from, I think they're from 1880. Um, but they look exactly like our genes today, including that stupid little pocket that you hate, right? <laughs> that fifth pocket. What's the only thing that's pretty much different from the genes that we wear today? Well, you can still get 501s that have the button fly, right? I have a couple pairs. Mostly they're zippers. But do you notice there's no belt loops? It only has buttons, because what would you, how would you wear these? Not suspenders. Braces, excellent. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but you can see mended, fixed, repaired. So important. Today I'm wearing my jean jacket that I love so much that I got when I was 15. I still wear it every single day that I can. So I don't do denim, double denim, I promise you. But that's how well denim can hold up. I mean, this is 40 years old, you know, and it's still, it still works and it still fits. Good denim. Um, and I just want to show you again, you know, this idea of a, the bowler hat kind of becomes ultimately the hat of the common man versus the hat of the, of the wealthy. And here we can see, you know, a series of overcoats and cloaks and such, but we are still seeing the general idea of what's happening here on this boat. Also notice the umbrella. I mean, that's not a little parasol to protect us from the sun. That's a real umbrella. So all these technologies, so important. That's it for you. Oh, this is for costume geeks. But you can see this diamond silhouette is really created through the way that this is cut. So can you see how deep that shoulder seam is? You know, more, mostly we have shoulder seams here. This one's cut back quite a bit. And then also lots of smaller pieces to create that really triangular silhouette. And, and just in case you were wondering, this is what we call a pre-Raphaelite painting, which was popular at the time and was sort of tied into the aesthetic movement. And so we often will see in these paintings, uh, Renaissance ideas, uh, Greek, Roman ideas and such. So don't be confused because this was painted at the same time. And if you pulled this up, you'd be like, that's not what David showed me, he lied. Well, okay, I lie all the time, but, uh, but that is still from this period. Okay? How do we do? Good. It's fun. <laughs>